Hi everyone, this is Ricky Spencer and welcome to another of our Sociology of Media Voices series. Today we're speaking with Shabel Zada, who is a disability and inclusion consultant, who's going to take us on a journey of his own life um, and talk about some of the challenges that he has faced and is facing and what it's like trying to balance a work life um, when you're caring for um, significant others as well as understanding how your organisation or your workspaces can include accessibility for those, and especially Easy Read. Like, what is Easy Read? We keep hearing a lot about it. And here is somebody today who's going, who's done the training, who's used it in his workplaces, and he's going to tell us how it's applied in workplaces and why it's important. Well, welcome, Shabelle, to our uh, series. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your journey, Shabelle. Um, tell us a bit about your life in the beginning. Where did you grow up? No, so I'm I'm very privileged to be to have grown up south, in southwestern Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been here my whole life. Um, yeah, so I'm Lebanese. I'm of Lebanese background, so we, my family, kind of stayed in just the multicultural areas. So I'm lucky to have grown up in Bankstown. Um, yeah, so that's where that's so where my me, beginnings are. So tell me a bit about um, growing up, Chabal. When did you start to realise that perhaps maybe you weren't um, heterosexual? That you may be gay. Sure, no. So I actually um, knew quite early on, I think. So I think I was in year six when I realized I must have been like 11, just, just about to hit puberty. And I realized, you know, just girls just didn't do it for me. <laughs> so um, I was very, very much realizing that I was very attracted to boys. And um, yeah, it was um, it was definitely a journey from the beginning, especially, you know, you're going to a school in a very multicultural kind mm -hmm. of conservative area. Just, it's like 50% fear, 50% percent excitement you know just like you no know, just one more piece of the puzzle coming together in terms of you know finding who I am so it was kind of exciting but also scary yeah and what was it like for you did you grow up in a faith-based family um I suppose I did yeah so my family is actually Maronite Catholic mm -hmm. um so yeah I we grew up in a very we used to go to St. Charbel's uh down in Punchbowl um she's very close to Bankstown and um we used to go there with, with, every Sunday and uh, yeah as we grew up it, our relationship with religion all took on its own kind of journey and uh, for myself I know I think I'm considered probably agnostic. Oh okay yeah so with your growing up and your journey was it difficult to make uh, friendships being how you felt inside or was that something that you put aside? Um, friendships were I think when something that really came into my life, I think around, I think after, I think when I joined university is when I first met queer folks who were just like me, who had the same kind of experiences, and just because living in such a such a conservative area, you're really not open about mm -hmm. like who you are as a person, and that kind of vulnerability, or well, the lack of vulnerability, can sort of like make it really hard to sort of build friendships. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it took me quite a while until I was able to feel comfortable to have people that I felt were friends. And um, yeah, uh, being a university student was completely life changing. So yeah. So tell us a bit about your journey at university. Did you find that there were accessibility needs that you required at university, or did oh. you just go on without that support? So um, one of the biggest things I think that doesn't get like addressed in just in the disability space, especially within multicultural communities, is the, the shame around disabilities. Mm. And so part of the shame is you don't actually talk about your problems. And so I think for the first two years, I actually just like struggled through university because I am hard of hearing. And so, you know, trying to be able to hear what the lecturers were saying, what the tutors were saying, um, were quite, was quite difficult. And it took a lot of internalized work to sort of let go of that internalized ableism it's to sort of just go up to the university and say, look, yeah, I have a I have a disability. I need some support to sort of be able to be on the same level as everyone else. And um, yeah, it was very difficult for the first two years. I struggled academically to sort of stay on top of things. And um, I think having note takers was completely life-changing for me. And oh. um, it really made things a little bit easier for sure. 
Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. So let's unpack that a little bit because I think there is this assumption out there in the community that, oh, well, we've got disability access in TAFEs and universities mm -hmm. for students, but it's not always the case that it's it's something that a student may want to necessarily disclose or are comfortable. How did you find that process of realising that, oh, I think I better get some supports what was it that kind of made you finally realize i think i do need the support um i think it was just a lot of self-reflection if i'm honest uh, my family we've got like multiple generations of disability mm -hmm. and just like mixed with the whole the ethnicity the background the cultural pressure the cultural stigma um it just like kept perpetuating itself i found that my my mother didn't get the help that she needed so she couldn't be the best version of herself of the that she wanted to be and I think I decided at one point, I just wanted to break the cycle, honestly. I just felt like, you know, I am entitled to actually ask for help if I need it. And it's just, it's not something I should be punishing myself with. I had a disability, I didn't ask myself, I didn't ask for that. And um, so it's, I accepted who I am as a person. I, have, I am a person with limitations and I have the right to ask for help to sort of overcome those limitations. And so I think it was a lot of internalized dialogue, a lot of internalized um, yeah, just like being able to unpack how I felt the cultural, you know, the cultural lesson that I picked up as I got older, I had to really just like unpack that and sort of leave some stuff behind. Now, Chabal, I want to now take you on a bit of a journey for those people who are listening. There, a lot of them will be teachers and lecturers at university. What something that you recommend that lecturers and tutors can do to support students? who are hard of hearing in their classrooms? That's actually a really good question. I think the, just the most immediate thing you could do is you could ask people with, who have um, disabilities to actually come to the first couple of rows, if that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is you could put a lot of the work, you could put captions on for your videos. Um, you, could, you could also just like ask people to come up to you at the end of the session if they needed some, if they need to privately ask for some accessibility measures. Um, just acknowledging in the session, in, in the workshop or whatever, that, you know, I'm happy to help any student with disabilities, just let me know. I think there's a lot, just because, you know, for myself, my my cultural upbringing meant that like, I wasn't the one to, to approach. Sometimes that for me to actually be, to get through the door, I had to actually be invited in. And so, yeah. So it's really having those uh, conversations yeah. early on at the 100%. start of the semester to really encourage students who may feel that they may want some additional supports. And what about um, the level of the voice when people are speaking in the classroom? Do you think that people should learn to, I guess, slow down their speech or or erase their tone? What, what sort of skills or advice would you give to people who are running lessons? I for sure would certainly start with asking those who had maybe some issues being able to follow along to come to the front of the, of the room. That's the first thing I'd probably would suggest. But I think definitely trying to slow down what you're saying is definitely a, a very big part of it just because I can't speak for others, but for my disability, if you start talking a little bit too fast, it just starts to sound less like words and more just like sounds. And just, you know, I can't decipher sounds. Um, so it's really important that they're able to actually slow down and um, if there were any other strategies they could use to sort of ensure that what they were saying was on paper, it's always a good thing for sure. Oh. Um, there's also like, there's also these fantastic tools called, called AI, AI, mm -hmm. AI, and basically it just records what you're saying. It's transcribing live time. And I found that very helpful. Um, I would also like creating a, maybe having a, like a specific table where note takers could come in and they could be as close to the actual lecture and they could actually be writing things down. Um, just like having those little things, it's, just, it's about making space for people with disabilities mm. in the end. And tell me a little bit with the note takers, mm. uh, what's the best way, like when we when new people come to work with somebody that, to form that relationship, what are some of the questions that note takers should be asking of uh, somebody that is hard of hearing uh, to give them the best support? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So I've had all sorts of note, note takers over my years at university, and I found some some of the notes that, that were taken really just glossed over a lot of the work oh. and a lot of the stuff that was being said. 
And so what some of the questions I do ask is, are you somebody who can actually stay focused for the whole hour, two hours that we're having a lecture or tutorial? Um, are you somebody who just writes generalistic stuff that's being said? Do you write about the general stuff or do you write about the actual specific thing that was said? Um, yeah, it's just really, I usually ask like, what's the writing style as well? Is it professional? Is it casual? How does it work? How does it look like? Um, I think this is really important because at the end of the day, it's about my education. And just like as note takers, your job is to make sure I get the best notes I can to make sure that I can participate in the class. And um, it can be quite hard, yeah. That is, so that's why I ask those questions for sure. And I think that's a really good point, Chabelle, because um, I never thought of that myself as somebody who's worked in a disability space, but perhaps even to have the note takers give a sample of perhaps their work if they've done it before. 100%. So you can see it whether that will meet your needs and yes. your style because I never realized that that taking notes if it's just just what are they taking notes mm. of and you're you're as you said it may not suit your uh cognitive uh skills if yes. they've already, you already have they have no knowledge of the area mm. and then they're writing very general and that may not support your learning needs so it's really good those sort of conversations yes. and being able to concentrate yeah um one of the one of the um one of the, i'll just give you an example mm. i actually had one class where you know the the obviously the note taker was a student they were paid quite handsomely for it and um i got maybe half a page from a oh. half a page of notes, and that was on a two-hour lecture. So it was very much, and it was actually a very important lecture. So it's very much, just, I really definitely need to ask those questions just to make sure I've got the right kind of note taker because it really could make or break my academic career. Mm. I can't actually, I can't do the work that I can if I'm not able to actually know what's happening. And it's, it can be really hard and disheartening to have to rely on others to sort of participate. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a relationship that I, you, you need to really build by asking those right questions. And Shabelle, what can people do at the university who are the people that organise the note takers? What sort of feedback would you like them to do in, in, when it comes to they hire somebody to mm -hmm. try and match you with the right person? Yeah. What's something that they should do once they've hired the person? to ensure that you're getting the best match and service? Um, I absolutely would have loved a, a bit of a stricter screening process. Mm -hmm. So basically part of that would be maybe they would, they, would give a, they would be given a task and essentially they would have to write notes based on that or maybe they would be asked to go to a, to a lecture and just write notes and so we can see what their samples look like. Um, I found that they did not do that and I think because it's a lot of work, a lot of extra work in the eyes of the university. But um, this is the work that's necessary to ensure people with disabilities are a part of the community. And um, it's, it's just breaking down barriers requires a lot of work. And if you're committed to it, that's what you're supposed to do. I love that because that's, a, that's we're giving some really good takeaways to people who are hopefully listening, who are in that space of working in the disability and inclusion centres at TAFEs and universities to really think, how can we screen and get the best note takers to support people, whether it's someone with a hearing or with a sight or different um, uh, uh, issues that they need to have support. It's very important that we get the best person for the job for in sure. order to get the person who's getting the notes and the information to you at the right level. With your journey in your studies, what other sorts of challenges did you find uh, when you were studying? Um, when I was studying, I suppose uh, the third, I suppose when I was working in groups and stuff like that, especially when we had the group projects, mm -hmm. um, it became quite difficult for me, especially to sort of be able to connect with my, I suppose my colleagues, especially because I am quite hard of hearing, mm. um, and so it can be it's a bit of a struggle, especially when. You know, I've got to do presentations and stuff like that. It's just uh, be able to have a cohesive presentation. I need to be able to work with my colleagues. And, you know, so being able to not communicate as effectively, not be able to hear what they were saying half the time, it makes things a lot more challenging. So it was just more barriers compared to the, uh, the average able-bodied person. And um, I think there were like little things the university kind of looked over, kind of glossed over, I think. There was a, lot of, a little bit of oversight. 
Um, because they, they did the, the, the obvious stuff. Of course you need a note taker for somebody who's hard of hearing. But like, you know, what about the smaller stuff? What if I'm doing group project, group work? Um, especially if I was in a tutorial and it was very loud and noisy. It's, I'm very, it's very hard to hear what the teacher's trying to say. Um, so it's just like these little things, the, um, these little situations they didn't really think about. And um, it's really worth asking, working with students with, with disabilities to sort of like really understand some of the other challenges that we're facing. Mm. Really, really good and important points that you, that you have raised. So for you, Shabelle, once you've uh, left university, what were some of the challenges that you had to face when trying to find work? No worries. Um, I actually had quite a bit of anxiety about um, speaking about anything disability related on my resume. Okay. Um, because um, I've heard all sorts of horror stories and there was a study that actually came out that people were already, you know, you were likely to be rejected if your name was already ethnic. And so it just makes sense to me. It made sense to me in my head, you know, if I was to disclose that I had a disability, would it look bad on me? Would it? Because I've had, you know, I've been treated like I was, like I'm stupid by people, by able-bodied folks because I didn't quite catch on what they said. And so that kind of anxiety really manifested itself um, when I was actually job hunting. Um, yeah, so there were times where I was really nervous about having to disclose a disability, whether I wanted to disclose a disability. And I suppose I never really had a, I suppose, any kind of role model or, th or language script that was ever given to me as to how do I navigate that? Because people weren't really thinking about people with disabilities who were working. You know, they just assumed people with disabilities were just othered away in, in the community. And so, yeah, just that conversation when I was growing up was just never had. So it was all about me navigating it by myself. And what about uh, your work? So um, and I know we re we met originally when you were working um, at Acon. Yeah. Tell us about your role at Acon. No way. So um, I was very lucky to have worked at Acon for two and a half years. Um, I worked on the Queerability Project, so it was their first um, LGBTQ plus people with disability project. Oh. Um, it was NDIS focused, and essentially we delivered 10 NDIS workshops and two train the trainer workshops. So the NDIS workshops were aimed towards the community, so looking at the NDIS through a queer lens, and the train the trainer workshops were aimed at industry workers, so basically trying to um, upskill the understanding of people with disabilities who were also part of the LGBTQ plus community. It was very exciting work. Um, lots of challenges because we um, did that project at the height of COVID-19. Mm. So there was a lot of pivoting for sure. So we went from wanting to do in-person workshops to doing strictly online. Lots of challenges that we faced along the way, but it was, it was a very good learning experience for sure. I have no regrets about that whatsoever. And tell me some of the... Um learnings that you kind of or insights that you gained when you were doing that project for sure i think um one of them is, is if you're working with people with disabilities you need to be prepared to be flexible and so what, what i mean by that is also being able to provide different ways of being able to gather the insights so rather than just doing an in-person workshop rather than doing an online workshop you can also consider doing written submissions online submissions you could do an art submission you know so many, so many different ways to get your message across. And I think it's really about if we want people with disabilities to be part of the conversation, we need to be prepared to listen in very different ways. So I think that was like the strongest takeaway I can have for that one. Mm. And I think, I suppose the next lesson was um, queer people with disabilities are not a monolith. We are, we are an extremely beautifully diverse community. And so it was you really have to be able to sit down and sort of engage with opinions that you might not necessarily agree, but it's just as people with disabilities, we are entitled to having our own opinion about all sorts of things. And I think that really comes back to the whole point about people with disabilities who are also queer have the right to also be as complex, as flawed as an able-bodied person. And I think something that really gets lost is able-bodied people, folks. Those folks don't really, um, I suppose, consider people with disabilities as whole people. It's mm. just, it's, we're just our disability, which isn't the truth at all. We're so much more than that and including our disability. And so those were the biggest lessons I learned. Your journey has been um, an interesting one that I have gotten to know, know you um, over the, the short time. One of the things that I was 
really impressed with is that your knowledge of easy read. And I know that is something that people talk a lot about um, yes. in the last couple of years. But can you tell our audience what does it mean when something is easy read? No worries. So um, I was lucky to have, to have gotten some training from the Council of Intellectual Disability on easy read. Um, so essentially, easy read just combines text with layouts and, and, and sort of images to sort of simplify and explain information. And so essentially, it's just it's about condensing complex information in just like easy to comprehend content. So it's been it's a work in progress for sure. And um, it's been a very useful tool, especially when we're dispensing complex information to people with disabilities. And um, yeah, it requires a lot of components for sure. So it's, um, it's just very simple stuff. It's quite intuitive, I think. Um, but it, there, is a, there is a method to the madness, I suppose. And it's all about like planning the structure, you know, keeping the text simple, making sure some of the text, some of the text uh, you know, is on a white background, having specific kind of font, specific kind of sizes, that kind of stuff for sure. And what I like about it is that it benefits everybody. 100%. Because, you know, isn't it? Because I know like in the area of health uh, promotion, sometimes medical information can be quite complex. Mm. They use a lot of jargon. Yes, for sure. Uh, so how do you deal with when it comes to jargon and easy read? Um, so I, yeah, I think I had an example of that as just the kind of dispensing NDIS information. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges I had to face was making sure I could dispense NDIS information in a way that was easy to understand. And that is no small task. The NDIS is convoluted, complicated, um, and changing all the time. And I suppose I used some of my easy read principles, especially when I was doing those workshops for the NDIS. And um, essentially it was about getting to the, to the point you're trying to make in the simplistic way you can and trying to deliver that in a way that's actually easily accessible. So, um, yeah, so we had, we, in, for the NDIS workshop, we broke it down into three streams. And um, the first stream was, you know, the, the application process. And so these, we had separate workshops and just like, that's how we use incorporated easy read as well. So in our workshop, it was very simplistic stuff. Um, it was pretty cut and dry, but I think when it comes to the NDIS, there's no, no avoiding the cut and dry, I think. And um, yeah, so it was a lot of breaking things down into very simple messages. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> Is that something that you would do now too, Shabal, in your work as a disability and inclusion um, expert? Is that something that you could help organisations with? Oh, for sure. Um, I would love the opportunity to, to do that. I think um, I feel like that is actually a, an accessibility barrier for sure. When you have jargon, lots of information being thrown at you, it can, and people have all sorts of disabilities, processing disabilities, visual disabilities, all sorts of disabilities that make spending complex information completely pointless. And so I would relish the opportunity to help any organization who's willing to sort of dispense information in a, simplis, in a simple way, but in an effective and efficient part. Mm -hmm. And one of the other challenges that um, that we've talked about before has been the important role of being a carer and how we really as a society need to be more um, understanding and for those who are carers. Tell us a bit about your experience of being a carer and what are some of the challenges that you have faced? Um, I was very lucky to have had the opportunity to look after my mother for about 13 years. Um, she's, she has since unfortunately passed away um, due to COVID-19 complications oh. um but yeah it was i very much had a fantastic opportunity to look after my mother for quite a long time um i suppose it was it was quite difficult i think just because you know i'm looking after a very sick woman while i'm coming into myself realizing who i am as a person mm -hmm. and you know um at the time i was i think about 17 when i started becoming a carer and mm -hmm. you know when you're 17 when you're 18, you're 19, you kind of want to go out. You want to do the whole normal human experiences that everyone gets to have. And, um, you know, just sometimes you don't get the opportunity to do that. You've got to go up a little bit faster than you're prepared for, I think. And um, I feel like I faced kind of unique 
situation when it challenges with my mother for sure just because unfortunately she was very sick didn't quite understand um I suppose sexuality and stuff like that and try, trying to explain that to her was quite difficult and there were times where I had actually repeatedly come out to her and each reaction to the to me coming out was quite negative mm. and um I think there's not a lot of discussion about how do you navigate becoming your own person while also having to sort of focus on someone else as a care and um, yeah, I just don't think we've, I've heard any kind of conversations about that kind of stuff. And um, I definitely know for a fact that I'm not, I'm definitely not the only carer who's also queer looking after family members or friends, whoever. And um, yeah, so that was a really big challenge. It felt quite lonely growing up because you weren't, I didn't think there were people who were in my set, who were in my situation. And that can be quite, um, I suppose, isolating. And you know it's 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 a snowball it's a snowball effect from there. You know if you feel isolated, you start to get depressed and depression, and then you have mental illness, and then it just it just snowballs out of control. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was quite difficult, but I had no regrets looking after my mother. Um, everything I do comes from love, so that includes all the professional work that I do, all the personal stuff that I do. Um, it's whether it's love for my community, love for my mother. It's, yeah, so I have no regrets whatsoever. And what were some of the um, adjustments that you had to navigate for when you were working? Um, how did you manage or organise care for when you were working? So I actually never got the opportunity to work full time until COVID happened. Suddenly everyone understood that they could actually work from home. And so, which I think is insane because, you know, if you had the opportunity to work from home from the very beginning, why would you not take that up? It would mean people with disability would have the opportunity to sort of, mm. you know, work full time. They'd have the opportunity to actually participate more in, in society if they wanted to. And um, I think, yeah, I was just working casual and part time before that. But when COVID happened, suddenly everything, work from home was a possibility. I was able to work from home and it was fantastic. Um, quite life changing for me. I don't think I could have done most of my full time job working from home or without working from home due to the due to how demanding my mother's needs were, mm -hmm. and it it meant that I was more of a. I suppose the work I found a lot of the passion, a lot of the stuff that I found passion for, um, just for my community and just being able to do everything for my community and also do everything I needed to do for my mother, just kind of made me feel a bit more complete. Because these are the stuff that were important to me. So being able to invest all of my time into both of these elements, you know, it really made me a better person, a happier person for sure. And what sort of um, role do you hope in the future to obtain? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think the future I can't really predict the half the time, but I would certainly love to work in something related to the community I've grown up in. So I'd take you plus people with disability space for sure. Um, yeah, I'm very passionate about access and inclusion. So any opportunity, I will definitely jump at it for sure, but preferably full time. <laughs> well, Shabelle Sada, it's been an absolute honour and privilege to have you. Um, we have put um, your details on. Uh, I think you're somebody who has a lot of skills and wisdom that can really shape a lot of organisations, and then especially for people listening who are in universities, here is somebody who could really help develop some of your disability and inclusion policies into practice and you know having somebody that can understand the complexities of coming from a cultural linguistic background caring for somebody and also being from our lgbtiq community and what does that look like and what does that mean when you're caring for somebody and you're still trying to na navigate your sense of self but also still trying to have some type of relationship with the person you're caring for. Very sure. complex. And um, this is somebody who has those skills that can bring them into your workplaces. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Very pleased to be here. Thank you.